Hi, y'all. Welcome to <laughs> my name is Jessica Reynolds. I'm the director of the Office of Downtown Development at the Georgia Department of Community Affairs. And with me today, we have Linda Thompson, who is the executive director for the Georgia Commission for Service and Volunteerism. And she is here today to talk to us about the AmeriCorps program. Thank so, you, Linda, Jessica. Linda, thank you for being here and thank you for uh, speaking with us today. <laughs> thank you for that great introduction. I feel like I know everyone already. <laughs> so as, as Jessica said, I'm the executive director of the Georgia Commission for Service and Volunteerism. You can just say the GCSV. And in short, we oversee AmeriCorps state programs in Georgia. So today, we're going to talk about who we are, who is the Georgia Commission, give you a little bit of history, talk about eligible and ineligible applicants, what is AmeriCorps, why AmeriCorps members are not volunteers, mm -hmm. why they're also not employees, uh, the roles of AmeriCorps members, the purpose of AmeriCorps, so give you some examples of AmeriCorps projects, and talk about direct services. So the Georgia Commission for Service and Volunteerism, we are a state agency because we're located within a state agency within the Department of Community Affairs. However, the funds that we receive are federal funds from the Corporation for National and Community Services. So we play two different roles. We are a grantee as well as a grantor and that we grant those funds out to qualifying organizations. And just in case you were wondering, we receive our funds based on a population-based formula. Each state does. And so since Georgia has a pretty huge population, we receive a pretty huge pot of funds every what, year. What? Good to be in Georgia. <laughs> Good to be in Georgia, yeah. So we receive between three and a half to four million dollars every year. But unfortunately, we haven't been able to grant all of those funds out since I've been here. And I've been here for, oh, I just made five years. <gasps> Congratulations. Happy anniversary. Happy anniversary. Yeah, I moved here from Missouri, uh, and even though even though Missouri and Square Miles is probably pretty the same size as Georgia, but Georgia has a lot more people, so receive more money. In Missouri, they received about two and a half to three million. We received close to four million. So I want to be able to grant those funds out. I want to get in some better applications. Um, anyway, just to tell you a little bit about us and our composition. We do have a board that we report to, and they're composed of 15 to 25 governor appointed board members. And then here at DCA, we have four staff, including myself. So we're pretty tiny. But our main function is to provide the funding to qualifying organizations to implement AmeriCorps mm -hmm. programs in their communities and neighborhoods and to oversee those programs, uh, providing them technical assistance and oversight. And technical assistance, you mean training? Training. Mm -hmm. We provide a lot of training, <laughs> and we provide a lot of oversight. Yep. <laughs> so kind of similar to what we do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you, if you, if you apply and you receive an AmeriCorps grant, you will see a lot of us. Mm -hmm. But our mission is to promote service and volunteerism in Georgia through AmeriCorps National Service Grants, community volunteer recognition, and support of local volunteer organizations and efforts. And oh, on a side note, just to let you know, this is AmeriCorps' 25th anniversary. <gasps> Yay! Yay! So this year we will be celebrating AmeriCorps' 25th. And one of our board members is an employee at Chick fil A headquarters out by the airport. Well, what? So free chicken for everybody. Free chicken for everybody. <laughs> so we'll be having a huge celebration um, October 22nd out by the airport. And if you are uh, an AmeriCorps alum or a VISTA alum or any National Service alum, please let me know. Um, my email address is linda.thompson at dca.ga.gov. Let me know, and I would love to invite you to this event. What, what? You can come to Jessica. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yay! And we're also we're going to have a full day of a lot of fun. We're going to swear in our new incoming AmeriCorps members for this year. Oh about 350 of them. Whoa. Yeah. And we're going to do like a, a <laughs> service project with the Veterans Empowerment Organization. Oh. Yeah, we're donating, we're doing backpacks for them, <gasps> of winter product, products and so forth. So it's going to be fun. Awesome. Uh, but I'll get back to AmeriCorps. <laughs> um, so it's a federal program that provides eligible applicants with the human resources 
necessary for addressing their most pressing civic needs, meaning we provide the people. So mm -hmm. you guys recruit the people, but we provide you the money to pay the people. Nice. So while giving individuals an opportunity to serve their communities in exchange for, in most cases, the AmeriCorps members can receive an educational stipend mm -hmm. that they can use to go to college, pay tuitions, or to pay student mm -hmm. loans, and they receive a living allowance, which is a small stipend. But I want to, this video says it better than me. Can you click on that link? We can try. So you have questions about AmeriCorps. Well, you've come to the right place because we're here to help. First off, let's clear up one thing right away. You might be wondering how to say or spell AmeriCorps. Sometimes people pronounce the P, but don't make that same mistake. AmeriCorps is alive and well, just spelled with a silent P. So think of Apple Corps or Core of the Earth. Now that we have that clear, what exactly is AmeriCorps anyways? AmeriCorps is simply Americans of all ages and backgrounds dedicating their time and skills to get things done. There we go. So how does AmeriCorps get things done? More than 80,000 Americans across the country join AmeriCorps each year, and all of them are tackling different problems in different ways. For example, AmeriCorps members help families attain affordable homes. They mentor students so that they stay in school. Perhaps there is a tornado, a flood, a forest fire, or a hurricane. AmeriCorps members also help communities recover from disasters. There are so many more things that AmeriCorps members do. But if we said it all, we'd be here all day. Why do we call them members, you ask? AmeriCorps members spend anywhere from three months to a year dedicating their time and skills to serve. They can volunteer with nonprofits, schools, public agencies, and community and faith-based organizations. And in case you were wondering, there are a few perks AmeriCorps members get, including money to pay for college, student loan deferment, training, living allowance, health benefits, and job opportunities with leading employers. Not too bad, right? All right, all right. What's the purpose of AmeriCorps? Like the military or the Peace Corps, AmeriCorps is a way to serve your country. AmeriCorps members make Americans safer, stronger, and healthier, and they strengthen our communities. But above all, AmeriCorps members get things done. That's it. That's what AmeriCorps is. Learn more about AmeriCorps at AmeriCorps.gov. So now we're going to dive into getting things done and exactly how that works. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I think we could just click on here. There we go. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Jessica did it. She's the I queen did. of technology. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on these, but I just want to tell you just a few about a few other programs that are under that AmeriCorps umbrella. So you can't see my finger pointing here, but <laughs> the the commission only oversees AmeriCorps state. So that's what we're gonna talk about today, but there's also AmeriCorps National. AmeriCorps National are typically programs that operate in more than one state. So say there's a Georgia program that also operates in say South Carolina or Florida, then they would typically apply to the corporation for a grant as opposed directly to the commission. And that's the only difference. AmeriCorps Vistas, the difference is that, well, they can be 18 or older, just like with AmeriCorps, but with Vista, which stands for Volunteers in Service to America, they want them to serve full-time only. AmeriCorps members can be full-time, half-time, quarter-time, minimum-time, whatever fits your projects, but Vistas have to be full-time, and whereas AmeriCorps members perform direct services, meaning services directly from the member to the constituent or to the recipient, AmeriCorps VISTAs form, perform indirect services. So they may be able to help your organization with grant writing or with uh, coordinating other services or building relationships, things of that nature. And then we have Senior Corps. Senior Corps uh, is for Americans ages 55 and older. Even though those same Americans can still serve in VISTA and AmeriCorps, you know, if they've already served their time out in AmeriCorps and VISTA, then they can still serve in Senior Corps. And so you have three components under Senior Corps. 
One is senior companions. They're elderly people that help other elderly people, typically going into their homes, helping them with small tasks and chores. Then you have foster grandparents, which typically tutor kids, kindergarten, maybe through third, you know, whatever type of tutoring. You may be, there may be retired school teachers who can even tutor kids in high school or college. And then there's RSVP, which is volunteers, uh, it stands for Retired Senior Volunteer Program, but these are simply volunteers that serve in pretty much any way you want them to serve. Also under that umbrella, we have AmeriCorps NCCC. The C stands for National Civilian Conservation Corps, and they have four campuses. The campus that would serve Georgia is located in Mississippi. And the way that works is that if you have a project in your community, it could be environmental, it could be disaster recovery, it could be, you know, repairing elderly people's homes or, you know, building a ramp for the disabled. You know, the list is endless, but the way it works is that they require a sponsor. So there's a short application that you complete and you tell them you want them to come to your neighborhood. They typically travel in teams of 10 to 12 people. And the only thing you have to do is to provide them a place. They bring their own mats and bunks that they <laughs> lay out and you have to provide them a place to spread those bunks out. And that could be a church basement or a gym someplace, just anywhere. They are totally not picky at all. You don't have to feed them, but if you offer them food, they're probably going to take it. <laughs> <laughs> as most but, of us would. <laughs> as most of us would. But the only thing they need from you is a place to sleep and a place to take a shower. And then they get the projects done in your community, which could last, I don't know, they vary. Could be a month, could be six months, depending on what you need. So just wanted to talk to you about those other opportunities. If you want contact information for any of those programs, just send an email to me and I'll give it to you. Now, the history of AmeriCorps. <laughs> AmeriCorps was created in 1993 through the signing of the National and Community Service Trust Act. And it engages millions of Americans each year in service. And then it was reauthorized in 2009 under the Edwin M. Kennedy Serve America Act. The one thing that I really, really like about that act is because anybody can serve, right? Everybody can be great, like Dr. King said, but the people with disabilities who are serving as AmeriCorps members, that living allowance they received was affecting their other benefits, like SSI and food stamps. And so the Edward and M. Kennedy Serve America Act of 2009 said, they can serve, but you're not touching their food stamps or you're not touching their SSI. Mm -hmm. So that's what changed with the Edward M. Kennedy Serve AmeriCorps Act with AmeriCorps. Same thing didn't happen with VISTA for whatever reason, I don't know why, but with AmeriCorps that did. So if you have people with disabilities that you want to recruit, which I strongly encourage, please do so. And their living allowance will not affect any other benefits they're receiving, such as SSI or food stamps. Oh, sorry. Oh. There you go. <laughs> so who's eligible to apply for AmeriCorps? Nonprofit organizations or faith-based organizations with 501c3 status, any agencies of local government, which is, I think, what a lot of you are, educational institutions, and that includes, you know, elementary schools, middle schools, high schools, colleges and universities, any educational institution. And the money that you receive from AmeriCorps is solely for program expenses. It cannot be used for general organizational expenses. Basically, it has to be tied to AmeriCorps in some way in order to use those funds. It provides opportunities for individuals, which we call AmeriCorps members, to serve in communities. We cannot, AmeriCorps cannot benefit for-profit organizations. They have to be non-profit organizations. And they cannot be non-profit organizations that heavily engage in lobbying activities. Okay. Those are ineligible. Also ineligible, of course, for organizations that have been convicted of a federal crime. <laughs> Can't imagine why. <laughs> <laughs> so, America, you could, you should look at your list and see who's hanging up right now. I'm just kidding. I'm <laughs> and the numbers are dropping. <laughs> <laughs> so, the, you heard me say earlier that AmeriCorps members are not volunteers. We're not drafting them like back in the day when people would get drafted for the military. So in that sense, they are volunteering to become AmeriCorps members because they want to get involved. They want to be a part of the solution and not a part of the problem. However, they're not, we don't refer to them as volunteers because they do receive a living allowance in most cases. Anyone who receives a financial compensation 
are not called volunteers because they're getting paid in a way for what they do. It's a modest living allowance, but it's still money. And they also receive an educational award. The educational award, like I said earlier, can be used for college tuitions or it can be used to pay student loans. Now, say you recruit AmeriCorps members who are older and have no interest in using an educational award. That's fine. They can give it away. They can give it away to a child, to a grandchild, to a foster child. They did not include stepchild in that definition. There's, there again, I think somebody just wasn't thinking. Mm -hmm. But um, if the child is adopted, of course, then they can receive it. And they have seven years to use that education award. So don't give it away to a newborn. Give it away to someone who's going to, going to be going to college within seven years. They can also receive health insurance if they need it while they're serving. If they need child care in order to serve, they can also receive a payment for child care. Now, we had one member to apply for child care, but he and his wife were separated and his wife was in another state and his wife had the child. He didn't. He didn't qualify for child care. <laughs> Only if you need child care in order to enable you to serve. <laughs> and, <laughs> and members do receive experience that you cannot place a dollar amount on. Mm -hmm. A lot of times these AmeriCorps members get snatched up by the organizations where they're serving as a result of their service mm -hmm. and they hire them full-time as full-time employees. Yeah. And the Spreedy Corps, I mean, they form relationships that last a lifetime, a lifetime. We've had a mere marriages, a mere babies. <laughs> <laughs> The list is endless. <laughs> so AmeriCorps members are also not employees. If you recruit an AmeriCorps member to serve for you, there's never an employer-employee relationship. If that member for some reason leaves and decides to try to collect unemployment, they don't qualify. Mm -hmm. If for some reason the unemployment office doesn't know that <laughs> and, and pay them unemployment anyway, that member is going to be responsible at some point in time for paying that money yeah. back. So they're not eligible for it because they're not employees. They cannot perform staff duties. They perform that direct service. And I like to use a tutor as an example. If they are a tutor in a classroom, they tutor the child, the student. They cannot be in charge of the classroom. The teacher can't call in sick and say, okay, Jessica, you're the American member. You're going to be in charge of the classroom. No, that cannot happen. They cannot be scanning cards in the cafeteria or helping with bus crossing, things like that. Now, if they need to do something to prepare for their tutoring session with the child, that's perfectly fine. Mm -hmm. But they just can't serve as an employee. So for that reason, we don't call them FTEs. We call them MSYs. And MSY stands for Member Service Year. I did not make this term up and I did not create this term. This <laughs> term was made up by the by the Corporation for National and Community Services. Really? Like, so when you don't like it, I'm exactly. not the one responsible for it. It's <laughs> not my terminology. <laughs> but member service years is equivalent to a full-time AmeriCorps member. And that's why. So AmeriCorps members, like I said, perform direct services. They cannot perform duties that are performed by staff or employees. You cannot hire AmeriCorps members and then fire some of your employees and say, OK, now they're going to do what these employees were doing. Cannot supplant employees with these funds. Uh, you also can't take your employees and say, now you're going to be an AmeriCorps member. You can't do that either. Uh, and they receive stipends, not wages. We don't call them wages because it is it's not even minimum wage. And they serve. They don't work. And they are members, not employees. So if you apply for an AmeriCorps program and you're awarded, remember in the first three years, there is a 24% match requirement. And that match can be a combination of cash and in-kind, or it can be all cash, or it can be all in-kind. We don't care, as long as you come up with some sources of match. So when I say in-kind, for example, if you are providing office space for the member for their service, you can use that square footage as long as you can provide documentation to show that you can use that as match um if, if someone is supervising that member who, who is an employee you can use that portion of that person's salary as match so that's just two examples that you can use as match uh, the list is a very long list of things that you can use as match after three years of receiving funds then your match gradually goes up every year until you reach year 10. and in year 10 the match caps at 50 percent it'll never go any higher. Would the match be 
specific to the employee or to the program. So like if you have um, an AmeriCorps member mm -hmm. come in and start working and they've been with you three so, years and they're moving to the four, would it would it up the match requirements or is it if you've just been utilizing the program for that many years? If you're utilizing the program that many years. Got it. So let's just say if you, I'm going to use $100,000 because yeah. it's easy, easy for me to figure out <laughs> my head, right? <laughs> so if you receive $100,000 from us as an AmeriCorps grant, then 24% of that hundred thousand dollars is what you'll have to come up with match as match. Got Does it. that make sense yes. now? Mm -hmm. So about a, about a about quarter of it. Yeah. So twenty five thousand. Now a lot of times I tell people this is your minimum required match. I recommend on your application that you stick to the minimum because the corporation says if you come in say if you're only required to come up with twenty four percent but then you come in at fifty percent match we're going to hold you to the fifty percent. So why go higher when you don't have to? Mm -hmm. I would stick closer to the 24% yeah. or whatever the required match is. Some people listen to me, some people don't. <laughs> <laughs> Story of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but say if you have a person, um, say if they're supervising two or three AmeriCorps members, you know, if that is not tied to the match. If that person is say 50% on your budget, mm -hmm. then 50% of that person's salary can be used as match. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. That okay. Is. So that's here's the way it works. So we receive the grant from the Corporation for National Community Services. Then we grant the money to qualifying organizations. Qualifying organizations recruit their own people. We don't recruit them. You recruit them yourselves. You can recruit them from your immediate community or however you want to do it. But those are your AmeriCorps members. You oversee those members, and then those members perform direct services to the beneficiaries. Cool. Okay. So these are some focus areas that the corporation think are really, really important. Um, this list is not at all exhaustive. You may have focus areas in your communities that's totally different from these, and that's 100% perfectly fine. So disaster services could pertain to uh, disaster resiliency or mitigation. It could be disaster response, recovery, whatever in that area you need to use it for. Economic opportunity, anything that has to do with improving the quality of life or the economic well-being of your community or individuals or families. So that could include job training, resume building, interview skills, you know, it, the list is exhaustive. Uh, education, anything pertaining to helping people to succeed in an educational way. It could be tutoring. It could be helping people to get into college, first generation college students. It could be helping people to, to succeed in college. Uh, it could be helping people to get their GED. Anything that pertains to education. Environmental stewardship, supports responsible stewardship, teaching people why not to litter, how that affects the environment. Um, it could be, you know, wildlife or it could be removing evasive species and replacing that with some local type plants. We have one environmental program at Jekyll Island which uh, rescues sea turtles from the ocean. We're going to be at Jekyll next week for our, Are you? our yeah. downtown I'll conference. I'll get you a tour. You want <gasps> one? Yes. Okay, cool. I'll okay. get you a tour. All right. Cool. Okay. So yeah, they <laughs> I got a little excited. Sorry. <laughs> so they rescue sea turtles that have been damaged by boats, propellers, mm -hmm. or maybe people throwing litter like those plastic um, things from yeah, cans in the, the ocean and then mm -hmm. turtles may get caught in those. Mm -hmm. And they have, they actually have a turtle hospital, which you're totally going to like. And they may, may let you see a surgery if you want to. <gasps> yeah. And then they rescue them. And then when they're well enough, they have a turtle release mm -hmm. and they put them back into the ocean. They have one turtle that they tried to release back to the ocean and she kept coming back. That would be me. So in the, <laughs> no, right? That's, that's me if I reincarnated as a turtle. I'm like, take me back, take, take me back, back to that turtle spa. <laughs> I want to go back to where they feed me three times a day. I know, right? and like I can just like chill out in the pool by myself. <laughs> and she kept coming back. She ended up at the zoo. Oh. They would keep, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then healthy futures. Well, I'm sorry, we digress. Healthy <laughs> futures, uh, anything pertaining to um, healthy futures. It may be teaching people how to cook nutritional meals on a low budget. It may be teaching, helping kids, maybe in school who may be obese, how to exercise or what exercise to do. Maybe helping people like myself, you know, exercise and increase physical activity. 
It could be anything related to getting healthier. Veterans and military families, anything that improves the quality of life for veterans or military families. It could be homeless veterans or you know just veterans in general. So like I said, the list is endless. And then the commission, we came up with a few focus areas of our own that we thought were extremely important. One is homeless, homelessness. And these are people, not necessarily people who are sleeping on the street every night, but an individual or family lacking adequate nighttime residence. Mm -hmm. So it could be, it could be a, a young person who's going from house to house to house who doesn't have a, temp, a permanent place to stay. Um, rural communities, communities with a population of less than 50,000 or placing educators in rural communities. So we really want to have more representation out in rural communities of miracle programs. And then I didn't know till I moved here to Georgia that human sex trafficking was a huge issue here. And so we would like to have an organization come in addressing that issue. Any organization that come in addressing any of these GCSV focus areas or any of the corporations focus areas may receive extra points on their application. Yeah. <laughs> now, I've had applicant, applicants to come in addressing like 10 different focus areas. We all know that's not realistic, right? Mm -hmm. So you're not going to get 10 points because the reader can tell that you're just saying that just to get the extra points. Yeah. So that legitimately addresses any of these focus areas. And when that comes into play, just say uh, before we receive $4 million and we've had, we received $8 million in requests. Mm -hmm. Right. So we get down to that last applicant and we can't decide, am I going to fund this one or am I going to fund that one? Well, this one addressed some of the focus areas. So that those two points may set that mm -hmm. one above the other one that we're on the cusp. Yeah. That's that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's pretty much the only time that will come into play. No, normally we just fund the applicants. Uh, if we have a cutoff score of 70 and we fund them until the money is gone. Now, programs that utilize tutors, I included the link here for you. You need to read that. Basically, it says if a tutor is going to, if someone's going to serve as a tutor, they have to have a high school diploma or at least a GED. There's some other stuff in here too, but we want the people serving as tutors to be qualified to serve as tutors. That makes sense. Yeah. These are some examples of projects just to give you an idea. But like I say, this list is not at all exhaustive, okay? Uh, school readiness could be academic performance, service learning, and I love service learning projects, by the way, mm -hmm. where the kids, they serve and learn at the same time. Uh, it could be college success. And I skipped disaster because I think I've already talked about that one to death. Uh, environmental could be lands improvement, community cleanup, renewable energy use, or public parks restoration. We did have one that addressed public parks restoration. Uh, Department of Natural Resources, mm -hmm. but they didn't come back in as an applicant last this year because they decided to do the same thing that they were doing, but without the federal funds. Okay. So, um, healthy futures, physical fitness, food and nutrition, quality of life for homebound or disabled individuals, or access to care of people aging in place. Economic opportunity, transitioning to safe housing, remaining in safe housing, financial literacy, or employability. Veterans, increasing the number of veterans engaged in service. I love that one. Uh, impact to quality of life of veterans, access to services, or increasing the number of veterans and military families served. So that would, could be veterans serving or veterans being served. Mm -hmm. Now, project periods are typically 10 to 12 months. My personal recommend, recommendation is less than 12 months. So I would say 10 or 11 months is my recommendation. And I'll tell you why. Uh, programs cannot exceed 12 months of program year. If, say, you have 10 members, let me use that as an, as an example, and say you have a 10 month program. So you have nine members who start in the first month. Now, with the living allowance, every member has to receive the exact same amount every month. Mm -hmm. If they're still serving, even if they don't serve a full pay period, the amount of the living allowance cannot fluctuate. So say if you have nine members that start in that first month, and then you don't recruit the 10th member until maybe month two, that member in month two is still going to get the same as those other nine members. Mm -hmm. And so at the end of the 10-month period, that second member is going to be short one month living allowance, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. So plus it's going to be one month short of earning his or her education award. So say if that member will come to you and say, I want to serve that, I want to serve another month so that I can get the, the number of hours to get my education award, full education award. And you call me and you say, can this member serve an additional month? Well, sure, because you haven't exceeded your 12 month period. So you're going to ask me for an extension and I'll grant it to you. Okay. Now, if you've already spent the money on another member who maybe started in that first month and decided this is not for me and left, well, it's a no cost extension. The member would just serve for the sheer uh, opportunity to receive the full education award. If you did not spend the money and you still have the money for the living allowance, you can still give that member the living allowance during that last month that you're serving and providing that you still have something for the member to do, yeah. obviously. <laughs> okay. Uh, we, because the corporation doesn't move as swift as we would like sometimes, we don't allow any programs to start before August 1st. And like I said, these are three-year grants, and that's kind of misleading because even though they are three-year grants, you have to apply every year. <laughs> I didn't make that up either. Um, but in the first year, would be you would be a new applicant, so you would complete the full application, however many number of pages it is. But in year two, you would be a continuation. So you would not have to complete the full application. Still have to reapply, but it wouldn't be the full application. In year two, you're talking about, okay, these are lessons learned in year one. I want to change this. I want to change the number of members that we had. I kind of, maybe I want to change my focus area. I want to change maybe some performance measures or something. In year three, you're still continuation. If you want to make changes, then you would address those. Year four, then you become a recomplete applicant, so you would go back to completing the full application again. Now, funding is not guaranteed every year. We look largely at past performance, how well you did in the previous year. New applicants, since AmeriCorps can be complicated, I don't think that is that difficult, but it's just different. So once you get a groove for running an AmeriCorps program, you know, I think it becomes much simpler. It's just staying on top of everything. So we encourage new applicants to apply for between five to 10 MSY, which are full-time AmeriCorps members. If you don't want full-time AmeriCorps members, mm -hmm. excuse me, that could be a combination of full-time, half-time, quarter-time, minimum time, or reduced half-time. So just say if you want all half-time members, then that could be 10 to 20 people because they're half-time, right? Mm -hmm. You see what I'm doing with the numbers. Yeah. If they're quarter-time, then that would be 20 to 40 people. So yeah. you, I think you all see where I'm going with that. Yeah. So, but not to exceed the five to 10 MSY, but any combination of full, I think they can see me pointing, right? I keep pointing <laughs> at the screen. <laughs> any combination. Any combination of half-time, quarter-time, minimum time, or reduced half-time. So, and this is based on last year's notice of funding opportunity. Uh, the, and this cost raises every year, increases every year, but last year, the cost per MSY was $14,932. So if you were applying for 10 full-time members, your grant amount would have been $149,320. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, of that $14,932, $13,732 went into the members' living allowances. That's how much the member received for the program year as a member of living allowance. So say if this was a 10 month program, you would simply divide the 13,730, did I do that? The 13,732 by 10, if your pay period is on a monthly basis and that's how much the member would receive a month. We're not telling you what pay period you have to have, you just go with whatever pay periods you currently have and just do the math. Now you see there's a difference between the amount that you can apply for per member versus what the member receives. That difference can be used for other member-related costs, such as you, I don't know if you've seen them, but AmeriCorps members typically wear these gray tees with an A on the sleeve, and Ameri stands for AmeriCorps. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you can use that money for purchasing those, you can use it for paying for their health insurance, or what, whatever member-related costs you may have. And if you come to an application workshop, which I'll talk about in a few minutes, I'll go into more detail on this. Um, at that time. This is just an example of what the scoring on an application looks like. So if you're applying for a grant, you can see that you have to talk about your need, that's four points. Theory of change and logic model is 24 points. 
evidence-based four points. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but this is just to give you a picture of what it looks like if you skip a section. Mm -hmm. We have applicants coming in skipping sections, and they lose a lot of points because of that. So you have to make sure that you address every section. I always develop a scoring rubric for our reviewers based totally on the notice of funding opportunity, because you'll hear us call the NOFO. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> So it's totally based on that, and they follow that to a T. So it's really important that every section be addressed. Now, if you're not ready for a full-blown AmeriCorps program yet, and you say, okay, we need some time to plan for this, okay, you can apply for a planning grant. And on the right side, that's what the sections for a planning grant looks like. You can ask for up to $75,000 for a planning grant. And basically, basically, that planning grant will be used for you to say if you need to do some research on what your project is going to be, determine how many AmeriCorps members we may need, what the focus is, get your listening groups together, kind of do some brainstorming se sessions, talk about it, set your timeline, things of that nature. That's what a planning grant is for. Uh, you might need, even need to get your financial systems in place to make sure that you can have the funds separated to be able to report better. But that's what a planning grant is used for. And this is an example of the points on a planning grant. That need is still really important, the evidence base. Now, say, when it comes to evidence base, if you don't really have evidence that your uh, project theory of change works, but say, but you've been doing this for a year or maybe years, and you've taken surveys and say it's a tutoring program, and you've done some numbers and you have some surveys to prove that this works, that the kids' grades are increasing. Something's changing and hopefully that arrow is going up and not down. Well, depending on what you want to change. <laughs> if it's crime that you're trying to change, you want to, you go, want down. to go down. <laughs> so, but you have some evidence that this is working. Or if you don't have evidence, you know of another program, another project that's done that, and you can use their evidence, okay? As long as you have some evidence that what you want to do is going to lead to some positive outcomes. So that's what that section's all about. And then I want to see a process or a timeline with this planning grant. So I can visit with you from time to time and say, okay, have you met, met, met this benchmark? Have you accomplished this? Have you accomplished that? And then I want some organizational background on why do you think, why do you think that you're, uh, that you have the capacity to oversee this grant, this federal program? And then your budget. Of course, you know, I didn't, I didn't create that. If, if Jessica or I had created that system where you input your budget, we would have put some math functions in there, okay? <laughs> so we use e-grants for where you input your budget, but it doesn't do the calculations for you, So, which is crazy, all right? But check your math. <laughs> use a calculator or Excel or something to check your math before you submit your, your, uh, your budget because we do give points for that as well. Now, I should be receiving, I'm going to Washington next month, and I should be, receive the notice of funding opportunity at that time. As soon as I get it, any of you who are interested in receiving it, I will share it with you, provided it's not embargoed. Um, and I will invite you to the application workshops that we're having in November. I included some links on here in case uh, you want to do some research on your own. These are last year's NOFOs and last year's supplemental guidance. I don't expect things to change a whole bunch, but I'm not promising you that it won't. So, but you can still look at these and kind of see what it looks like before you actually commit to getting into it. And like I said, you want to, if you're interested, I would love to see you at one of the application workshops. We haven't set the date for those yet, but I would love to send you an invitation if you're interested. Here's my contact information. And Jessica, this PowerPoint is going to be available to everyone, right? So you, you have my contact information. Mm -hmm. And um, questions? Yeah, perfect time for questions. Um, someone asked, could you please review the matching criteria again one more time? Sure. I'll go back to that slide. Am <laughs> Just I... kidding. No, you can't. Tell me when to stop. Uh... Right there. there we go. Yeah. So the matching criteria. So say you say, okay, let's make up an organization. XYZ is a nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. They have their 501c3. Mm -hmm. They applied for a grant, and last year was their first year of receiving this grant. They applied for a $100,000 grant. For year one, they will have to come up with a 24% match. Mm -hmm. And like I say, that match can uh, be a combination of both cash and in-kind 
Who asked the question? Um, Shanti. Shanti, mm -hmm. did you have a specific? Um, but you said it can be in kind and. It can be a combination of in kind and cash. So, like you receive donations from some philanthropy organizations or grants or something, you can use that as a match, providing it's not another federal grant. Okay. Typically, you cannot use federal grants to match federal grants unless it's from the Department of Education. But I would still ask for a letter from them mm -hmm. giving you permission to match this AmeriCorps grant with their grant. Now, if you had a local community foundation, could you apply yes. for something from them? And then if they approved it, use that as matching yes. funds? Yes, you cool. could do that. This, I, I don't know, does that answer your question? Maybe. <laughs> Shanti's over us. <laughs> oh, did she leave? No, I don't oh. know. I'm just joking. Oh. <laughs> Shanti, don't go. Please come back. All right, guys, do you have any more questions for us? It doesn't look like it. Well, thank you. If you come up with some questions later on, just oh, I'll you. just don't hesitate to um, contact me. You have my contact information, phone, email. I prefer emails because I travel a lot and I can always answer them on the go. Yeah, I completely So agree. go to the end. I want to give them my okay. favorite quote. Oh, I love this. Yeah. yeah, this is my favorite quote in the whole world. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving and tolerant of the weak and strong because someday in your life you will have been all of these absolutely true very true well, thank so you. thank you all so much you're welcome oh, we're hugging <laughs> i'm so glad we did this i think it's such a great program and it has so um, much applicability and i think really aligns well with what our programs are doing locally so i hope this will encourage people who have been on the fence or maybe unaware to, to kind of jump in and take advantage right. of this. Right, I hope so. We're <laughs> a great group of people to work with. Yes, I can attest to that. They're a lot of fun. <laughs> so thank you guys and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Oh, that was fun. Yay, that was good. <laughs>